I am Norma Edwards, and I am here uh, responding to an invitation to come and share a little bit of this very unusual spiritual experience that I had when I was 26 years of age. And I lived in London, England. I was married, I had one son. And um, I somehow didn't know that I was going through my second pregnancy. And then I began to feel pain and uh, very sickly. I was away from work for about a month and doctors didn't seem to know what was wrong with me, you see. Simply because when I had my first child, they told me I'd never have any more children. So nobody, nobody checked for a, for a um, pregnancy test. Nobody ran a pre pregnancy test. And um, it was my first day back at the office. I worked for British Railways Board at the time. And um, during the day, it dawned on me that the pain that I was experiencing resembled that of labor pains. So at four o'clock, uh, the pain intensified in the afternoon and I asked whether I could leave early. It's very interesting that I stepped into the elevator and in the elevator, there was only one other person. She was a female and she was a Hindu and she was dressed in her Hindu attire, the dot and the foreign. And we rode the elevator down. Now, as you can imagine in the sixties, the elevator stopped with a jerk. And when that elevator stopped with a jerk, all hell broke loose inside of me. I collapsed became unconscious. Uh, she was a very intelligent young woman. We were blocks away from St. Bartholomew's Hospital, so she didn't call an ambulance. She got people to help her to get me out of the elevator and into a cab, a couple of blocks down the road. And um, I was admitted to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And um, she was left to port somewhere in between consciousness and, and slipping into unconsciousness, she'd ask me, what is your name? And I said, Norma, that's all she knew about me. Now my handbag that included my identification, etc., got left in the, in the cab, the driver's cab, because he helped her get me into the emergency room and he drove away with it, but brought it back the next day. So here she is and she knows nothing about me except, but she said her name was Norma. That was it, I'm unconscious. So they took a picture of me and they gave it to the police and asked the police to do some investigation to find out who I was. And at the same time now they wheeled me, while they're wheeling me into the operating room, I became semi-conscious. And I remember the doctor saying to me that um, I had a, a dead baby inside of me and they had to take me into to surgery to remove it. It was four months old. And then I passed out again, excruciating pain. The next experience I have is that I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down. Now you have to remember in 1960, nobody knew, nobody talked about this. There wasn't even a name for it. I'm looking down on my body on the operating table, but I'm in perfect peace. The pain is gone. And I'm feeling very peaceful. And I, I can see looking down that this group of people, nurses and doctors, they're concerned for my life. So I'm thinking, uh, how can I get down there and let them know the pain is gone? There's no need for all this concern. Immediately, I had the thought, this is something that I've taken away from my near-death experience. Our thoughts take us directly to what we are thinking. So we have to always be very, 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 very careful about our thinking. No sooner than I thought, well, how do I get off of the ceiling? I'm on the floor. And I'm moving between the three doctors and I'm going, hello, hello, you don't need to perform the operation. I'm fine with it. Dawn on me. They can't see me, they can't hear me. The interesting thing is that in that state of consciousness, believe it or not, your processing becomes very, very clear. And the thought occurred to me is, oh, well, they're males. Maybe that's why they can't see me. Women are more receptive. So now I'm following the nurses around. You know, as they, 
they, they move to pick up the instruments, etc. And I'm trying to say to them, I'm okay, hello, hello. And then it dawned on me, nobody can see me. And then I watched the graph flatline. And I knew what it meant because I had nurses in my family. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I can't be dead. The only other explanation I could give to it is that the equipment is malfunctioning. <laughs> When the doctor picked up the, I call it the paddles, I could see the level of electricity around it. And the thought in my head was, if they apply that to my body, they are going to kill me accidentally. And if there's any way I could, I need to get out of this place before they actually kill me. <laughs> and with that thought, went straight up, straight through the ceiling. And now I'm in a very, very dark tunnel. There is no fear. I'm perfectly relaxed. And I'm moving almost as fast as the speed of light. And as I come around a corner, I could see the end of a tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, there is like this, you know, like you see, can you imagine it, an expanded rainbow with all those colors? And I'm moving swiftly towards it. And as I get to the exit, the color in front of me changes to absolutely brilliant white light. And the thought in my head, again, I'm thinking, if I ever merge with that light, the velocity of the light will burn uh, my eyeballs. It, the, the light was so intense. And then I merged. And when I merged, there are no words in any language you could think of to describe the joy, the peace, the beauty, the love. And I recognized that I had become love and that I was very, very happy and comfortable to be home. So I merged with the light and again, my thought is, how does one get around in this environment? As soon as I ask the question now, I'm moving, moving very swiftly. And I stop in front of the largest television screen I've ever seen in my life. Even today, they don't make television screens that big. And I stop in front of the screen and the screen begins to scroll very slowly. And as it begins to scroll, I recognize that it's divided into three columns. The column on the left shows my life as I had planned it before birth. The column in the middle shows me what I have done <laughs> with that plan once I had arrived on earth. The column on the far left and the far right says, as though someone had created a stamp, objective not accomplished. Now the screen is scrolling and it's just, it's kind of like divided now into objectives, you know, objective number one, number two, this is how you lived it. And then when I get to the, 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 the third column, objective not accomplished. Now I'm, st it was not judgmental. You know how when you're on earth, you would go, oh my God, I can't believe. I'm amused. I'm amused and I'm laughing my head off. Well, how could, that's kind of simple. How could I not have known that, that this was expected of me, you see? So the screen comes to an end and I'm really in laughter. I'm like, how could I have been so stupid? I lived 26 years of my life and I, I didn't even stop to ask the question or figure out what my life was all about. It, it, seemed, it seems ludicrous and it brought laughter. There was no judgment, no judgment at all. And after the scream came to an end, um, when I was a child, I was raised in a Christian community. Uh, both grandp grandparents were pastors and we spent a lot of time in church. So by the time I was 12, I used to say, I've, I've heard every sermon you could possibly hear, and I've gone through the whole of the Bible in Bible study. So um, the screen comes to an end, and, and um, 
I had a lot of questions when I was growing up from all that time I spent in church. And nobody seemed to be able to answer my questions. But the one that was really, really at the forefront of my mind was the priest of scripture that said, Christ came and he said he came so that we may have life more abundantly. And I would ask every pastor I could get my hands on, well, what did he mean by that? Because he died and people have continued to die. What did he mean by that? That one got me into so much trouble that my mother put me to sit down and she said, I don't even want you to look at pastor. <laughs> don't even look at him. Don't ask him questions he can't answer. And of course, I'm even more baffled now. What do you mean he can't answer it? He is a pastor. But that particular question stayed with me. So when they, when they, um, when they showed me my life as I had lived it, that question popped into my head again. And as the question popped into my head, I was moved to what I've come to know now as the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is the record of everything that has happened on Earth and on other planets, and it is listed there. So the screen uh, cleared, and when it reappeared, it seems like the, 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 the screen I was looking at got even bigger. And it began to now scroll. And it's now showing me the lives that I have lived before this one, some of the lives I've lived before this one. And um, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm very aware of what, what I was intended to learn from it. Um, I saw myself, uh, first of all, in the dark, 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 dark ages where there was no light in the world and people walked around, walked around with those blow torches. I saw myself um, when there was war, there was tribal war. And the, 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 the tribe I, I lived in was losing that war and they were afraid that in losing the war, if they lost too many women and children, they would not be able to rebuild. So they gathered as many, I'm looking at this in the record, they gathered as many boats as they could and as much food as they could and they put it in the boats and then they put the women and children in these boats and push them out to sea that somehow they may survive to come back and replenish the community. There were 24 women in that boat with me and some children, the boat capsized and we drowned. We all drowned. And I realized standing there looking at that that I was carrying a tremendous amount of fear of water. Fascinated by it in my living experience, I would go to the beach, I would kind of walk out there and just put my feet in the water, but you couldn't get me to dive in because there was this tremendous fear. So I'm standing there now and I'm recognizing that's where that tremendous amount of fear came from. Then the screen kind of scrolled up again. And now I am seeing myself as a, a warrior. I'm a male and I'm a warrior. And I am very much in the midst of war. And again, this, this fear or the, 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 the feelings that you get when you kill another human being because your own nature is not that of killing, but it's necessary. Can you see, can you feel that? Yeah, I can feel, I can feel all of that, that emotion in there. Then I saw myself at um, the Nile when the women pulled Moses out of the bulrushes. And I was among the women who were not only bathing there, but they were also washing clothes at, at, in the water. And um, kind of watched their discussion about what they should do with this baby, et cetera, et cetera. And found that I had a lot to say about, well, let's, let's see if we can encourage the queen who had no children you know, to adopt this baby. So then the next place I move to now is um, Paul. Paul on his way to Damascus when he was struck from the horse and feeling and experiencing what he experienced while he was blind. 
Do you remember he was blinded before his sight was restored? So I had that experience. But the two experiences that just about blew my mind and took years of processing was this. Then I moved to a plantation. I'm a slave girl and I'm there with my mother and I'm very aware that my father is not too far away even though it is quite clear that nobody around knows that that's my father, if you see what I mean, very confusing. And um, we're picking cotton. And I could hear the hooves of the horse of the massa man who's coming down the rows, you see. And as he comes down the rows, if you're not performing as efficiently as he thinks you should, I could hear the sound of the whip on the back. And he's moving in the row. The next row will be ours. And I'm petrified as a child. I might be about 10 or 12. I'm petrified that when he gets to me, I will get the whip because I can't meet the quota. But as, as, as he comes around the turn now and is approaching us, and I've kind of like stiffened myself waiting for the lash, I am moved to the next screen. And the next screen, I am a white male on that horse, wheeling the whip. We live every single experience. That's where our oneness comes from. Um, that one, that one, that one, I, I just, just couldn't put, put that together because in those days, nobody was talking about these things that we're talking about. I'm 80 years of age now. So those days, nobody was talking about this stuff. And um, it came to an end. And when it came to an end, it's like all these questions that I had accumulated. See, what I had started doing was writing them down in notebooks because nobody could answer them. They were all biblical. And I'd written them down in, in, in notebooks. One of the things that, 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 the, one of the things that really bothered me was Peter and Christ. Even as a child, I never believed that Peter betrayed Christ. Never believed it. I, I just couldn't believe it. And c coming away from the record, it dropped the image into my, into my mind. And, and this is how I saw it. When Christ came off the mountaintop after his 40 days there, he came across Peter and his father, did he not? And um, he looked at Peter and he said, you follow me. But what I saw in my image, in my experience, was that in those days, a man didn't walk away from his family because if he did, they'd starve to death. Peter had a father, a mother, and a mother-in-law, a wife, and children. And when Christ said to him, you follow me, Peter heard the authority in Christ's voice. And even though he had a lot to lose, he dropped everything and he followed the authority in his voice. And then they shifted me now to Peter the night when Christ was betrayed. And those famous words, before the cock crow, you, Peter, will deny me three times. It was an authoritative statement that Peter followed to the letter. So I kind of came away with that in my head, like, whoa. So that answered my question. And I always, always, always felt that Peter was so uh, touched and amazed by, by Christ. He, 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 he you know, preached the gospel, blah, 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 blah. He gave his life for the gospel. So that answered that question straight away. Now, after um, the review at the Kashuk record, Again, my, my idea is now, what next? Where do we go next? And again, I start moving very swiftly. And now I am taken to a river. When, we, when I was a child, we used to sing, yes, we will gather by the river. The beautiful, the beautiful river. There is a river. And on the other side of that river were hundreds of souls. 
all of which I could feel had very strong loving feelings for me. These were people I had lived in lifetimes with. These are people I had lived in villages with. There was a lot of love and what they were doing was beaming all this love into my being. And um, some of them I could recognize because they had died in my lifetime. Most of them I couldn't recognize, but I could feel the energy of love that they were projecting into me. So I began to walk into, wade into the water. And my aunt, who was like the most recent family member who had died, because my parents were still alive at that time, she starts walking towards me. And um, just to the point when she's reaching out to embrace me, she pulls her hands back and she says, I'm so sorry they're sending you back. And I said, why? And she said, they're sending you back with a message. And I said, well, hello, there are millions of people back there. <laughs> they can surely get in touch with one of them and give them the message. I don't want to go back. Who would want to go back living in this absolutely enfolded in all this beautiful light? And she says, well, no, I'm sorry. They're sending you back. I said, well, what is the message? There is more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. And with that, I found myself falling, 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 and suddenly moved from perfect peace into excruciating pain. <laughs> Even though I was under anesthesia, I experienced the pain when I re-entered the body. You know, you literally have to squeeze, squeeze this phenomenally large spirit into this, what looks like a tiny body. And the journey of readjustment and realignment began. Because from the minute I entered the body, I realized that I, I can only call it a paradigm shift. Because a paradigm shift is like lifting everything that you believe, putting it to one side and replacing it with a whole other belief system. That's exactly what I felt when I opened my eyes. Because when I opened my eyes, I was in... Um, recovery and they had two nurses sitting at a table and I guess their job was to keep an eye on me and they were I guess folding bandages or something but both of them apparently belonged to the same church I had a near-death experience on a Monday and on a Sunday and now it's Monday see and um they're talking about the fact that one of them had to work that Sunday and the other one was off and went to church and they belong to the same church. So the one is summarizing the sermon for the benefit of the one who was not in church. And apparently the sermon had a lot to do with hell that day. And I am lying in this bed and I am horrified. There's no other word for it. How can a pastor get on a pulpit and preach that there is a horrible place like hell? There is no such place like hell. But of course, I can't verbalize what I'm thinking because they've got this tubes in my throat, you see. So I'm forced to listen and I'm feeling very traumatized. Well, well, that's not right. I mean, God is about love. God is about absolute love. What are they talking about? So that conversation comes to an end and they had a little transistor radio on a table in front of them and they turned the radio on and music, beautiful classical music began to stream out of the radio. Only now, I can see the notes. Every note is tied to a color. Every color is tied to a mathematic symbol. And they are moving and rotating very quickly. And I'm watching these two young ladies sitting there enjoying the music with their hands working. And they're totally unaware that they're absorbing all this beautiful energy that is coming out of the music. <laughs> and I'm fascinated. Oh my God, I always loved music, but I did not know. I could see the healing properties of music, particularly those drums. And then two two um, medical workers came along, they were male. And I was fascinated as I saw them approaching and I'm wondering, well, I wonder if as male, they'll be able to absorb this energy in the same way as I, I watched the women. And, and of course, they come along, they're talking to these two women, they're totally unaware. And, and I'm watching this 
absorption of, of energy, you know, it goes in and it pulls stuff out and it gets diffused. And, I, and I'm just, I can't talk, I can't speak, I'm just, then I began to notice that I can, I can tell what the nurses and the staff were thinking. And in some cases, I could look at them and think, oh my goodness, they're here to help people recover and they're totally unaware that they themselves have got medical problems that they're unaware of because I can see it. You see what I'm saying? I can see it in their bodies. So then eventually they moved me over into, in those days would be a ward. And you have about six patients, six beds in the ward. And there was this one woman, oh my goodness. And she was in so much pain and she was crying out and uh, the nurses were trying to kind of, you know, um, help relieve it. And I turned to the nurse and I said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. She's going home. <laughs> and later in the night, she died. She said, because you said it as though it was a happy thing. And I said, yes, it is a happy thing. Of course, they couldn't get that. Now, the day I left the hospital, it was very interesting. Um, my husband came to get me and we stepped out of the hospital. And now I'm looking at the trees. And I could see the energy. It's winter. So the trees is London, it have no leaves. But I could see the energy coming up from the roots to sustain these trunks. And I could see the color of the energy. And I could see where, how it's affecting keeping this plant alive. I could see all the way down into the ground, the way in which the, the roots are absorbing the energy. And the energy, of course, is color, different colors. It was just the most amazing experience of my life. And the journey began. Well, the answer for me came, you see, with the, with the statement, life is eternal. I mean, churches and pastors have got to wake up that Christ came to demonstrate to us that life is eternal. It wasn't this one in a million thing that happened to him. This is what we all can expect. Because if you really stop and you, you examine it, he died, they buried him, he rose from the dead. He walked and talked with his, with his disciples. Uh, for the time that he was on earth, and then he ascended. That is preached as though, well, that's the only time in the history of the world that happened, and it happened just because he was Jesus. It's the same for each and every one of us. Life is eternal. This earth is a school. That's what they taught me. Earth is a school. It is the most difficult school in all the planets. So, you, you know, it's like suddenly getting a break. You're poor, you don't have money, but you get a chance to go to Cambridge University. You see what I'm saying? Being allowed to come to Earth is coming, coming to the world's best uh, classroom. And while we are here, we are made, I saw that we are, we make a decision what it is we're coming to learn and to experience. And we put on hold a whole lot of information. See, understanding that is what helped me to give the kind of service I did in prisons with men and women who were professional, you know, professional killers, murderers, thieves, because while we come to earth, we are playing a role. That's not who we are. We are dabbling in certain things so we can get an experience. And we do have one of the things I learned from my near-death experience and, 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 and the after effects afterwards is that we each of us come because we want to overcome something from our past, some fear or develop a, a skill that is going to be needed when we leave earth because so many of us do not understand that there are a whole lot of other planets besides Mother Earth. There are a whole lot of other dimensions. And when we descend to Earth, we very often are looking for the experiences that will allow us when we pass from here and no longer have to manifest here, and we become a part of a team 
that is responsible for guiding a planetary system, we have all the experience we need. So we put on hold very often a lot of the good that is inside of us because, okay, I know that's good. I didn't come to experience that. I didn't come to add to that. I came to understand the suffering of humanity. I came to understand certain things so that if I am designated to be a, a team that is going to manage a planet, I've got all the answers. Love is the key. And it's unfortunate that here on Mother Earth, we take love and we assign it to sex. <laughs> love is the key. When we recognize like I do when I step outside that the same stuff that I'm made of, the same stuff the stars are made of, the same stuff the animals are made of, the same stuff that keeps the water flowing, we are all one. And what holds us together is this concept, this element. When you can see love, love has different levels. And when you've got spiritual sight, you can see those levels. Love is the key to the happiness that we're looking for. Love is the key to making our world a better place. Love is the key that will help us to to breathe. You see, we don't, one of the things when I came back, I discovered the power of the breath. Every time we breathe, we take in the divinity of the universe. And if we are conscious of how precious that is, because we can't buy it anywhere, we understand that when we take it in, we take in the healing elements that we need. If we are focused on the fact that with every breath we can clear the stuff we're carrying. We take the divinity in. We focus on that which we need to release. And when we breathe out, we breathe it out. We are constantly keeping our system clear enough so that we can not only learn, but we can love. We can learn to love. We can learn to give love. We can learn to receive the love. And above all, it took a 97 year old man to hold my hand and teach me that I am, see it's one thing to hear it, it's another thing to know it. I am a piece of God. And with every breath that I take, I take it that divinity inside of me. And that divinity has the potential to wash me, clear me, and allow me to live here primarily with that abundant love, that abundant forgiveness, 